Good evening. Uh, first of all, let me say thank you very much for coming tonight on this uh, interesting evening that has been raining for a while, like apparently it's going to continue raining, so it shows a lot of commitment on your part. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, my name is Julio Carrion. I'm the uh, director of the Center for Global Land Area Studies, and uh, I want to uh, welcome you to the last lecture of the semester in our Global Agenda series. Uh, we have had the opportunity to uh, talk about issues affecting regions such as Africa, the Middle East, China last week. Uh, we also explore uh, some important trends in global public opinion. And tonight, we turn to Latin America. Uh, for many years, as you know, uh, this region was a significant area of preoccupation in US foreign policy. Uh, but recently, it has been neglected, uh, not only by U.S. Uh, policymakers, but uh, the region seems to have receded into the minds of uh, many observers. Uh, Michael Reed, uh, our speaker tonight, uh, wrote in his first book, and I quote him, that uh, Latin America is neither poor enough to attract pity and aid, nor dangerous enough to excite a strategic calculation, nor until recently has it grown fast enough economically to quicken ballroom pulses, end quote. Uh, but despite this lack of neglect, Latin America has not been forgotten here at the Un University of Delaware, and we will continue talking about uh, the region. Uh, we are truly lucky tonight to have with us uh, one of the most incisive observers of Latin American politics and economics. Uh, Michael Reed came to the region for the first time in 1982, uh, a few decades ago, and uh, he started writing for The Economist in the early 90s as Mexico and Central American correspondent. In 1996, uh, he moved to Sao Paulo, Brazil, to assume the position of bureau chief with the magazine, with The Economist. From 1999 to 2013, he was The Economist, America's editor. Uh, of course, as soon as the magazine learned that we have invited him to come to uh, the Global Agenda series to speak, they rushed to promote him. And so recently, he became the writer at large for Latin America and he became also the first uh, writer of the Bejo column, the first uh, column on Latin American ever uh, published in The Economist. So he is now based in Lima, where he's coming back after a couple of decades. Um, while writing weekly for The Economist, uh, Michael Reed has found time to publish two uh, books. The first entitled, uh, the Forgotten Continent, The Battle for Latin American Soul, which was published in 2007. And uh, I have the privilege to use that book a few times in my own courses. Uh, just this month, uh, he, he released uh, another book entitled Brazil, The Travel Rise of a Global Power. Tonight, he will uh, speak to us about where the region uh, is uh, today in, in, in economic terms uh, and where it might go into the near future. So without further ado, please join me in giving him a warm uh, welcome, Michael. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Julio, for that uh, um, kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's great to be here uh, on this uh, beautiful campus. Um, I don't know if uh, all of you have read 100 Years of Solitude, Gabriel Garcia's Marquez's great novel, but if you have, you may recall that in Macondo, it once rained solidly for five years. Um, I note that you have begun your own special homage to Garcia Marquez. Um, I think I would have preferred it if you had um, 
uh, decided that it should rain yellow flowers as it did once in uh, Macondo uh, because, as Julio says, I recently moved back to Lima and Lima is actually a desert city. It's the world's second biggest desert city after Cairo. It, it doesn't rain in Lima. And uh, although I'm British, I managed to forget to bring an umbrella. So uh, if uh, I look like a drowned rat, I'm sorry. Um, what I want to do in the next uh, 40 minutes or so is to look at the recent um, economic, social, and political evolution of Latin America and offer a few thoughts about um, where it might be headed in the next few years. Though in doing so, I'm conscious of George Orwell's observation that to see in front of your no what is in front of your nose is a constant struggle. It's always much easier for us to imagine continuity than change. If we look back just a dozen years to 2002, there was widespread despair among Latin Americans and analysts of Latin America that the region was locked in economic torpor, political instability, and apparent uh, democratic regress. I'd actually spent 15 of the previous 20 years living in Latin America, and I was actually less pessimistic. I was convinced that democracy and economic reform were bringing positive changes whose fruits were not fully apparent. And that's why I decided to um, write uh, the book that my publishers urged me to call Forgotten Continent. That, involved, that title involves a certain amount of journalistic license. I mean, Latin America is not a continent. It's a continent and a half or, or, or less than a continent, depending on how you count the Americas. Um, and um, it, it, of course, hasn't been forgotten by the 550 million or so Latin Americans. But what I meant by that was that it was unjustly ignored in the world for the reasons that Julio summarized in that quote. And along with neglect went ignorance. Ronald Reagan, on returning from a visit to Latin America in 1982, said, you'd be surprised they are all separate countries down there. <laughs> now, that in fact is a profound truth. They are separate countries and they're different. And um, uh, that they often defy generalizations about the region um, as a result. And indeed, one of the characteristics of Latin America today, as I will uh, uh, explain, is the division that, that exists between the free trading, free market countries of the Pacific Alliance uh, and the more protectionist countries of the Atlantic seaboard. My argument in Forgotten Continent was not, in fact, that the United States should, quote, do more for Latin America, unquote, as some people in this um, country sometimes say. In fact, James Reston, a distinguished New York Times columnist, once said, um, the, United, the United States will do anything for Latin America except read about it. So, so I've been glad that I, you know, sometimes um, that's been proven wrong. But what I meant by, uh, about it being a neglected, unjustly neglected continent was that what's been happening in Latin America, I think, is of global importance because Latin America has become the world's third great region, third great region of democracy alongside Europe and North America. And it's been struggling to make democracy work in a context of poverty and inequality and to use democracy to overcome these scourges. The speed with which the Arab Spring has turned into an authoritarian winter shows just how exceptional Latin, American, Latin America's experience is. And today I think things look much better in the region than they did a dozen years ago. There's been faster growth, the rise of a consuming middle class, and the ambitions of Brazil have all quickened outside interest in the region. The United States, for example, exports uh, its exports of goods to Latin America amount to more than one and a half times those uh, that it sends to China. Nevertheless, I will argue that the region is once again at something of a turning point. In, in reviewing the present and the recent past and thinking about the future, I'm going to talk first about 
the economy and uh, the societies and then look at um, political trends. The years between 2004 and 2012 were in many ways a golden age for Latin America, a faster economic growth, generally low inflation, social progress, and in many countries a strengthening of democracy. The region had an impressive growth spurt, with GDP expanding at an average rate of 5.5% a year in the five years to mid-2008. And for the most part, the region uh, navigated the world financial crisis of 2008 pretty successfully. And it managed a swift and strong recovery with um, growth of 6% in 2010. But note that growth has fallen in the past two years to just 2.5% uh, last year. Of course, the regional average conceals widespread variations um, in those many separate countries. Uh, thanks to the commodity boom, over the decade to 2010, South America, with the exception of Venezuela and Paraguay, did better than the regional average, while Mexico, Central, Central America, and the Caribbean is slightly worse. Overall, Latin America's performance has been better than that of the developed countries, so it's, it has at last begun to close the income gap um, that it has existed for so long, albeit modestly. The progress over the last decade has, not been, has been not just macroeconomic, but also social. Between 2002 and 2008, around 40 million Latin Americans left poverty. And though the recession slowed that down a bit, um, uh, poverty has resu resumed its downward trend, but it is slower, uh, the fall. The fall in poverty is partly due to better targeted social policy, but mainly to the impact of economic growth on the labour market. Unemployment has fallen dramatically, with many countries close to full employment, and real wages have risen in most places. All in all, some 35 million formal sector jobs were created in Latin America in the decade to 2011, according to the World Bank. Income inequality is falling too. And that matters a lot because Latin America has long been scarred by extreme inequality of income, which has had a series of negative consequences, reducing economic growth, fermenting political instability, and creating fertile ground for populism. Data for the first decade of the 21st century here show inequality decreasing in nearly everywhere with the Gini coefficient, the standard measure of inequality, falling on average by almost three percentage points, including in Brazil and Mexico, the two giant countries in the region. But note that despite a decade of progress in this respect, Latin America still ranks, along with Africa, as the most unequal region in the world. Nevertheless, a huge social transformation is underway in many Latin American countries. Fewer people are poor, most people are better off than they were. This has prompted a certain amount of triumphalism about the rise of a new middle class, as it's called, now held by some to form a majority of the population in Brazil, Mexico and Chile. I think a degree of realism is needed here. Many of these people can more accurately be described as lower middle class or working poor, and their situation remains fragile. The World Bank in 2012 published the most rigorous study so far on this issue. And it updated the numbers uh, earlier this year, and these are the latest numbers. It employed a realistic definition of what it is to be middle class, having an income sufficient to provide a degree of economic security, calculated as a daily income per person of between $10 and $50. Having crunched the numbers from household surveys, the bank reckoned that Latin America's middle class expanded by 50% in just six years, between 2003 and 2009, from 103 million people to 152 million. By 2013, the middle class represented around 34% of the population. But the largest single group is what the World Bank called the vulnerable. They have left poverty, but they could easily fall back into it. 
Of course, being middle class is not just about income, as economists like to think. Sociologists would say that it's also about education, occupational status, and ownership of assets. But for consumer goods manufacturers and retailers, the important thing is, is that both the new middle class and the vulnerable have disposable income for the first time. Latin America has seen a consumption boom embodied in the spread of supermarkets and shopping centers, which are now to be found in places in Mexico City, in Lima, which were considered shanty towns 20 years ago, or in uh, towns in the interior of Brazil's northeast that have been considered poor for centuries. Places where such uh, modern retailing outlets would have been unthinkable a generation ago. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, the past two years have seen a marked economic slowdown in the region. Um, analysts are busy slashing their forecasts for growth this year. and There's a worry that the new normal for growth is around 2.5%. The main reason for the for the deterioration is a less favorable external environment. From around 2002, the industrialization of China and India unleashed a commodity boom unprecedented since the early 20th century. That gave a huge boost to Latin America's terms of trade, the ratio of the prices of its exports to those of its imports, especially for the commodity exporting countries of South America. China's demand for Latin American commodities and its export of cheap manufacturers reshaped the region's trading patterns. Total two-way trade with China rose 20 times between 2000 and 2012 to 236 billion a year. But as China's growth slows, commodity prices, excluding oil and gas, have fallen by around a quarter since 2012 with metals hit harder than foodstuffs. Secondly, the US is at last moving towards a more normal monetary policy after several years in which liquidity has been cheap and abundant in the rich world. Because this is a sign of strengthening economic recovery in the US, that's good news for Latin American countries that export to it, like Mexico. On the other hand, the cost of capital will rise for Latin American governments and companies. So what happens next? Some analysts foresee a return to Latin America's notorious history of economic volatility and financial crises. There have been a couple of spasms of market, financial market jitters in the region over the past year, since the Fed first started talking of tapering. But most of the big countries in the region are better placed than in the past. As well as, the cheap, uh, as well as the commodity boom and cheap money, there was a third factor behind the golden decade of growth, and that was better macroeconomic policies in Latin America. Greater fiscal and monetary discipline were a lasting legacy of the Washington Consensus, even if it is a legacy that dare not speak its name in the region. Many of, the, many of the larger countries have been well served by a policy tripod of floating exchange rates, inflation targeting administered by more or less independent central banks and, less, and a less pro-cyclical fiscal policy. Latin America is much less vulnerable than in the past. Its international reserves quadrupled between 2001 and 2011. Its public debt has fallen from almost 60% of GDP in 2002 to 25% in 2011, and roughly half of that debt is now financed internally. At the same time, as a result of lessons learned the hard way through banking collapses in the 1980s and 1990s, the region's financial systems are strongly capitalized and tightly regulated. For most countries in the region, the biggest challenge is not imminent financial collapse, but the danger of slow growth over the medium term, that 3% or 2.5% does turn out to be the new normal. The virtuous circle of the past decade, in which the foreign, re foreign exchange and tax revenues provided by the commodity boom underpinned stable currencies and, an, and allowed an expansion of domestic consumption, <coughs> 
is drawing to a close. From now on, there will be no rising tide that lifts all boats and all countries. Those countries that do things better will perform better. I think countries like Colombia, Peru and Chile are in the strongest position because they have room to respond with some fiscal and monetary stimulus. Mexico has embarked on important reforms, notably opening up its energy industry to private investment, breaking a taboo established in the 1930s, though these reforms will take time to pay off. Brazil has great underlying economic strengths in agriculture, in energy, increasingly in biotechnology and things like that. But its commitment to responsible monetary and fiscal policy has frayed since 2008. It faces an adjustment in 2015, whoever wins the presidential election there in October. Venezuela, and to a lesser extent Argentina, clearly squandered the commodity boom, and they are facing a reckoning. In general, growth will have to rely much more on productivity, innovation, and competitiveness. Unfortunately, the region's historical record on productivity has been abysmal, especially in services. The Inter-American Development Bank found that if, if the productivity of labor in Latin America had kept pace with that in the rest of the world since 1960, real incomes in the region in 2005 would have been half as high again as they were. In the 1990s, what economists call total factor productivity, the efficiency with which labor and capital are used, was actually, in, was actually negative in Latin America, according to the IMF. Things have improved a bit in the past decade, but they improved much more in Asian countries, so the gap between Latin America and Asia is not being closed. It's worrying that the main contribution to growth in Latin America over the, that decade came from adding labor to the labor force. The labor force was growing. The region's been enjoying a demographic bonus in recent years with a bulge of young workers entering the labor force. But now it's rapidly passing through a demographic transition. Latin America is starting to grow old before it has become rich. By around 2020, the size of the workforce will start to shrink in relation to the dependent population of, of children and, uh, and retirees, which uh, raises big issues for growth and also for the, afford, for, afford, afford, for the affordability of pensions in the region. So why is Latin America so relatively unproductive? and what can be done to change this. I would highlight, highlight three big issues. The first is informality. The fact that around half of Latin Americans still work in the informal economy, the black economy, the unregistered economy, whatever you want to call it. Um, in other words, they, don't, uh, uh, the, they work in businesses that are not legally registered as, as such and don't pay taxes and so on. That is a drag on efficiency and growth. Many informal firms are small and technologically backward, and they're condemned to stay so because they are informal. And at the same time, their presence restricts the growth of um, uh, more efficient formal competitors. Informality is a hugely complex issue, as much cultural as economic but reform of tax, of regulation, and of labor markets would certainly help to reduce it. A second big reason for weak productivity is poor transport infrastructure. This has meant that Latin America did not reap the full potential benefit from its trade opening of the 1990s. One study, remarkably, has found that freight costs for exports from Central America to the US can be higher than from China to the US, which is absurd. Several countries are trying to mobilize private capital to invest in roads, railways, ports, and airports, but it's proving to be a slow business. The third big reason for low productivity is Latin America's poorly educated workforce. In fact, the region has made big strides in, in expanding educational 
educational coverage in the past two decades, and that's very good news. Though it will take still many years for most Latin American countries to catch up with educational levels in developed countries or many Asian ones. Of the bigger countries, only in Chile and Argentina have a majority of the workforce at least completed secondary education, though the same applies in Costa Rica and Uruguay. Nevertheless, in Brazil, a six-year-old today can expect to achieve twice as many years of education as his or her parents. The expansion in schooling has in turn, in turn been one reason why income inequality has fallen, because the premium, the wage premium commanded by education has fallen because it's become less scarce. But the big problem is that when Latin Americans are in school, they don't learn enough. The eight Latin American countries that were among the 65 countries that took part in the latest PISA international tests of secondary school performance in 2012 all came in the bottom third of the ranking. In Panama and Peru, the worst performers, nearly a third of 15-year-olds tested, were close to being functionally illiterate. Visit a public school anywhere in Latin America and it's not, hard, it's not hard to see why. The teachers themselves are often poorly educated and trained. They stand at a blackboard writing things on a blackboard. The children are talking amongst themselves, uh, are, are un, unmotivated. You often see classrooms uh, where there is no teacher because the problem of teacher absenteeism is chronic. And the school day may well be short because of the need to accommodate two or three shifts of pupils. Education is, of course, intimately linked to innovation, or rather to the re relative lack of it in Latin America, which is another uh, drag on productivity. The region invests only around 1% of GDP on research and development, which is less than half the average in, development countries, in, de in developed countries. Again, there are some signs of progress, especially in Brazil, which now turns out half a million graduates a year and 10,000 PhDs, 10 times more than two decades ago. Some analysts argue that Latin America is doomed unless it matches the rich world in spending on R&D. I'm not so sure. The region still has enormous scope to grow by catch-up, by copying innovations made elsewhere. Import a machine or best practice in management and you will probably increase firm productivity considerably. This suggests that those economies which are open to trade and competition and to ideas will do much better than more, than more protectionist ones over the coming years. And as I mentioned, in that regard, Latin America is profound, profoundly divided today between the open free market Pacific countries and the more protectionist Atlantic ones. So the Brazilian election in October could start to change that. More generally, raising productivity requires public policy reforms of labor markets, taxes, infrastructure, and education, as I've mentioned. These are much more complicated than macroeconomic reforms, which can be done from the top down. Productivity enhancing changes require governments to rediscover the appetite for structural reform they lost during the commodity boom when the living was easy. With that, let me turn now to the region's politics. The first thing to say is that the economic and social progress of the past decade has gone, on, gone hand in hand with the gradual strengthening of democracy in most countries of the region, though not, of course, in all of them. Of course, too, Latin America's democratic institutions have plenty of flaws. And polls show that many Latin Americans are critical of the way their democracies work in practice. But the point is that democracy is becoming a habit, and that makes it more likely to continue. It is also providing more stability. Between 1999 and 2005, eight Latin American presidents were forced out of office before completing their terms. Since then, only two have suffered that fate. Mel Zelaya in, in Honduras and Fernando Lugo in Paraguay. 
Not coincidentally, the strengthening, the strengthening of democracy has gone hand in hand with a second political trend, that of improvements in social policies. In the past, social spending in Latin America tended to benefit the relatively better off because much of it went on pensions and social security benefits in a Bismarckian social insurance system that excluded the poorest 50 to 60% of the population because they were in the informal sector or because they were in the countryside and the system didn't reach into the countryside. But over the past two decades, health and education coverage have steadily expanded while around 110 million or a fifth of the poorest Latin Americans now benefit from conditional cash transfer programs, such as Oportunidades in Mexico and Bolsa Familia in Brazil, which pay a small monthly sum of money to mothers in return for them taking their, making sure their children are at school and get health checks. In many places, private investment in what used to be known as shanty towns has been matched by a, a gradual improvement in public facilities, such as transport, parks, and sports facilities. The third big political trend of the past decade has been the, unprecedented, um, the unprecedented dominance of the left, at least in much of South America. One reason for that was simply the alternation in power of contending political forces that is absolutely normal in democracy and that in Latin America had often been prevented in the past by military coups or the threat of them against the left. The loss, what some people have called the lost half decade of economic stagnation between 1998 and 2002 brought popular opprobrium for the liberal reformers. And uh, when I say liberal, I mean liberal in the British sense of um, uh, not the American sense, uh, liberal in the sense of free market reformers who were in power in many countries in the 1990s and who had implemented the Washington Consensus. But in addition, in a region where many people were poor, it was not surprising that leaders of the left who stood for redistribution began to be elected. But as has been widely noted, there are two broad camps among these left of center governments in South America and in Latin America generally. Though the, the distinctions among them constitute a spectrum more than a binary division. The first camp is broadly social democratic. In office, it has preserved the macroeconomic framework of the, of the Washington Consensus, adding to it more ambitious social policies financed with higher taxes and in some cases, a bigger role for the state in industrial policy. This applies to the left of center governments in Chile, Brazil, Uruguay, and El Salvador, and now a bit to Peru. The second camp is both more populist and more statist. It is associated with personalist, personalist leaders who pledging to refound their countries have weakened checks and balances and the separation of powers. To a greater or lesser extent, these governments have increased the share of the economy in state hands through nationalizations and or expropriations. They have been more protectionist and less fiscally, responsibly, uh, fiscally responsible and much more hostile to the United States. This applies to varying degrees to Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, Rafael Correa in Ecuador, Evo Morales in Bolivia, Daniel Ortega in, in uh, Nicaragua, the Kirchners in Argentina. But a common factor does unite both these lefts. The appeal of people like Chavez, Morales, Correa, or Brazil's Lula to the dignity of poorer indigenous or Afro-Latin Afro Americans should never be underestimated. In some ways, the populist leaders have created the appearance of more inclusive democracies, while in reality undermining that by their top-down paternalism or authoritarianism. The abuse of state resources for partisan purposes, the capture of the judiciary and the electoral authorities, and threats to independent media are a common feature in Venezuela, Ecuador, Nicaragua, and to an extent in Bolivia and Argentina. Venezuela and Nicaragua are especially worrying examples of authoritarian regress, 
of the exercise of a crude majoritarianism. But the populist left as a continental force has been in retreat since about 2007, well before Hugo Chavez's death. Having spent as if there was no tomorrow, tomorrow has finally come for the governments in Venezuela and Argentina. Their mounting economic difficulties are weakening their popular support. In Argentina, Cristina Kirchner is pragmatically retreating towards orthodoxy. Venezuela is split down the middle between a regime that is incompetent, corrupt, entrenched and authoritarian and an opposition which is probably taken to the streets too early. Outsiders must hope that the current efforts at dialogue will succeed in setting rules so that the recall referendum on President Maduro that the Constitution allows in 2016 can be held in democratic conditions. But if the dialogue fails, it is possible that Venezuela follows Cuba in becoming the second totalitarian country in the Americas, though I find it hard to imagine that this extraordinary outcome in a wealthy country with a certain democratic tradition could be a lasting arrangement. And as for Cuba itself, by allowing themselves to become dependent on Venezuelan aid, the Castros have tied the fate of their, their regime to that in Caracas. Raul Castro has set in motion a transition to capitalism in Cuba, albeit one that is intended to be slow and partial and not accompanied by political change. But it is an ineluctable process, both because of the economic bankruptcy of Cuba and because in 2018, Raul, for reasons of age, intends to hand over power to a new generation, which will be judged by Cubans strictly on its economic performance. Of more immediate importance for the region than what might happen in Caracas or Havana will be events in Brazil. I believe the presidential election in October is wide open and that the opposition of the center and center right has a strong chance of ending 12 years of rule by the center-left Workers' Party. If this were to happen, it would change the political climate in South America as a whole. It's reasonable to assume that the factors that have helped the left over the past dozen years may start to go into reverse. As growth slows, electorates are likely once again to seek an alternation of power. The center-right therefore has an opportunity with a, with a political agenda based on the notion of opportunity. But it will only prosper if it recognizes the importance of social policies for the poor. Reforms and greater efficiency remain a hard political sell in countries where only a minority pay income tax. Nevertheless, structural reform is back on the political agenda in the region, as Enrique Peña Nieto's government in Mexico shows. Beyond partisan politics, two big issues will shape the region's political life over the next 15 years. The first is citizen security, or rather the lack of it. Latin America, a region free of conventional wars, has the world's highest murder rate, higher even than Africa. With just 14% of the world's population, Latin America sees over a third of its killings, according to the UN and it's got worse over the past decade. There are important variations. The Southern Cone remains safer than the rest of the region. Over the past decade, the murder rate has fallen steadily in Colombia and in some states in Brazil, such as Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. But it's risen dramatically in Mexico, Central America, Venezuela, and Brazil's Northeast. The spread of extortion undermines the quality of life for many Latin Americans. The illegal expropriation of public money is a, is a growing problem by, by criminal syndicates, partly linked to the decentralization of public spending to local government. The explanation for the crime wave are well known. The presence of organized criminal syndicates, many of them linked to the drug trade, the traditional weakness and corruption of policing and the judiciary, the insecure hell holes that pass for prisons, and a large cohort of young men, some of whom fail to find opportunities in the legal economy. It may help that there will be fewer young men in the future because of the demographic transition, and more countries may legalize drugs, but real progress 
in citizen security means a coordinated effort involving police, prosecutors and judges. Colombia has made some progress in this regard. The question is whether other Latin American governments will be capable of this. If not, the region risks a Hobbesian dystopia of fear and violence that will also undermine economic development. There can be little doubt, for example, that Mexico's economic growth has been neg negatively affected by security worries. Perhaps the biggest political question for the region concerns the future of the middle class. Note that it has been economic growth much more than social policy, social policy that has been the driver of the expansion of the middle class. It's widely assumed by political scientists that a bigger middle class brings a more cohesive and stable democracy, less prone to populism and more intolerant of corruption. Certainly, a strong middle class with some property and some education is more likely to believe in the need for property rights and for some democratic accountability of government. But this will take time. The political attitudes of many of today's middle class in Latin America were formed in poverty. While many Americans' only political demand of government is for it to get off their backs, Latin Americans are more schizophrenic. Many look to governments to solve their problems, while others, having despaired of that, refuse to accept that citizenship implies responsibilities and the acceptance of rules as well as of rights and benefits. The middle class is starting to place more sophisticated demands on the state. They want better health and education services and better value for their taxes and not just visible public works. In that regard, the student rebellion in Chile of 2011 and the protests for better public services in Brazil last June are a sign of things to come in the region. Indeed, improving the quality of the region's education systems is vital both for productivity, for the expansion of the middle class, but also for creating more inclusive societies. Latin America continues to be blighted by inequality of opportunity or lack of social mobility. In other words, more than in most other parts of the world, the life chances of a young Latin, America, a young Latin American are largely determined by the situation of their parents. If there, is a, if there is a sharp interruption in economic growth in Latin America, perhaps as a result of upheaval in China, that could have big political consequences. As Francis Fukuyama, amongst, amongst others, has written, no group is more dangerous politically when its expectations are disappointed than the middle class. Indeed, revolutions are almost always the work of the middle class rather than of the poor. A large number of graduate taxi drivers is not a sign of progress. Remember that Argentina was a predominantly middle class country in the 1960s, but that did not stop it slipping into a spiral of decline. To sum up, Latin America has made remarkable progress in the past decade. As a result, the region is much more self-confident and independent-minded than in the past. The arrival of Chinese trade, investment and finance has offered Latin America an alternative partner. It is these factors, more than mistakes by the administrations in Washington, although these have certainly existed, that largely explain the relative loss of US influence in the region. But the going is going to get harder for Latin America. Unless governments rediscover an appetite for reform, as I've said, economic growth and social progress in the region will remain subdued. The main risk that slower progress would bring is political rather than economic. On the one hand, a slowdown ought to provide the incentive for a return to structural reform. But on the other hand, frustrated expectations might prompt a return of populism. The populist bacillus may be in remission, but it is still present in the Latin American body politic. Achieving complex reform in democracies requires mobilizing political coalitions for change. If Latin American countries are unable to achieve this, they risk spending the next 15 years in the so-called middle-income trap. 
in which labor is no longer cheap, but is insufficiently productive to compete. I do have a, what Albert Hirschman, the great development economist at Princeton, who died last year, called a bias for hope. Latin America has underappreciated strengths, such as in farming and energy, increasingly in uh, education and uh, science, though there's a long way to go. It's uh, improving the quality of education has at least moved to the top of the political agenda. My long-term weather forecast for the region would not be the binary choice offered by the great Mexican painter Rufino Tamayo, but the default weather forecast in my country, sunny intervals with scattered showers. Thank you very much indeed. Really, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I was saying that uh, it, it was a very impressive uh, presentation. So, you, you basically argue. I have two questions, or maybe I want to start with my first question uh, in reference to two countries whose immediate uh, development in the next six or seven months might, might determine the medium-term uh, uh, history of, of the region. One is Venezuela, and the other, of course, is Brazil. Uh, in, in Venezuela, you, you wrote your most recent column uh, in the case of uh, Theodoro Pekov, who has been uh, harassed by the government, the Maduro administration. What do you think is happening in, in, in Venezuela? It seems to be, at least some of the American media uh, argues uh, or shows that it's mostly the middle class in Venezuela that is protesting the Maduro government, uh, assuming that that's a bad thing. But is it really just the middle class, or there is a, 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 a sense of dissatisfaction that goes deeper than the middle class? And what do you think is going to happen in the short term in Venezuela? And my second question, I'm going to ask you, I, uh, is relating to Brazil. You, you, you mentioned we have presidential elections in Brazil scheduled for October. And uh, apparently Dilma, the current president, is, is the favorite, but you question that, whether that might be the case. So what are the indications that you have that shows that maybe the PT party will uh, lose the election this time? And what will be the consequences of that for the region? Well, I think in Venezuela, in Venezuela is split 50-50. No? It's a 50-50 nation, and it has been for, for several years. Um, that split is broadly along class lines, though not absolutely so. Um, uh, I think the government side is clearly on the defensive because uh, popular discontent about um, the economy, widespread shortages of basic goods because of mismanagement. Um, uh, Venezuela will have the highest inflation figure in the world this year. Of It's already at around 60%. Uh, the economy has stopped growing, um, uh, and uh, in, uh, Venezuela is now about the third most violent country in the world in terms of the murder rate, right? Um, uh, and there are all those discontents. I think the government, you know, and secondly, Maduro, who inherited this terrible legacy from Chavez of mismanagement and, and squandering of this massive oil windfall um, that lacks the political skills that, that Chavez had and the communicational abilities and also the kind of strategic sense. Uh, and he also lacks the unquestioned authority over the Chavista movement and, and the bases, the, 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 uh, uh, the grassroots that, uh, that uh, Chavez had. Um, I think as a result, he has been moving, uh, the Venezuelan regime has been, move, move, been, more, move, been moving in a more totalitarian direction. They've been closing down space for the opposition. And that's what lies behind the strength of the protests, um, together with frustration over, I mean, obviously the main driver is frustration over insecurity and 
in the economic situation, but the oppositional sectors in it, and they're worried about whether they'll ever have the chance to compete in an election uh, uh, again, mm -hmm. right? Now, I think the government did not want the dialogue that started. Mm -hmm. I think it was pushed into it by the neighbours. Uh, I think um, for Brazil, I mean, Venezuela has become a domestic political issue in many Latin American countries, and public opinion is overwhelmingly on the side of the opposition. Now, you know, that's public opinion that follows events, so it's not a majority of the um, population, but I mean, the polls show that. Um, so, uh, so the Brazil in particular felt impelled to kind of organize this dialogue. I don't think Dilma Rousseff, whose party broadly sympathizes with the government in Venezuela, uh, will put it sufficient pressure on from the outside to, uh, to force the government into, into, into conceding the opposition's basic demands, which are freeing, freeing political prisoners, um, uh, controlling these armed Chavista gangs who've done quite a lot of the repression, um, and um, uh, filling the, uh, the, 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 there are several members of the Supreme Court and the Electoral Authority who are Chavista sympathizers, whose term ended a long time ago, but their replacements have to be chosen by two thirds of the National Assembly, and the government doesn't have two thirds, so they have to be uh, chosen by consensus. And I don't think the government will concede those demands without further pressure, stronger pressure from the outside, or from uh, or a return of much bigger demonstrations, or if discontent, if tangible, active discontent spreads more on the Chavista side than it has so far. Um, We'll have to see. I mean, one hopes the dialogue will be successful, but uh, I'm not particularly optimistic. On Brazil, I think what's happened is that um, actually Dilma Rousseff is not as effective a political leader as Lula. I think she's mismanaged the economy. Um, she's allowed inflation to get up to above 6% steadily. Brazilians, because hyperinflation in Brazil was uh, was conquered after that in the rest of the region. The memory of inflation is still strong in Brazil. Brazilians are very intolerant of inflation. Growth has been low. Um, Dilma is relying on the fact that over the last 12 years under the Workers' Party, conditions have improved enormously. I mean, uh, real wages have gone up a lot. There is full employment and so on. But real wages have stopped going up, basically. And, um, and Dilma is not a very skillful politician. And I think, you know, Brazilians are not thinking about the election yet. They're, you know, thinking, about the World Cup. They're thinking about the World Cup, exactly. <laughs> um, and and um, the, poll, the polls show that Dilma is the favorite, but the polls also show that over 60% of those asked, when, when you ask them what kind of president do you want the next president to be, do you want them to be like Dilma Rousseff or different? More than 60% say they want them to be different, and that's a problem for Dilma. And she's starting going down in the, in, in, in the polls. Now, for a, change, for a change to happen at elections, a government has to lose an election, and an opposition has to win it. I think the government in Brazil is doing everything possible to lose the election. I think the opposition has not yet done everything possible to win it. And you know, that's where the doubt is. So I think it's an open election. And you know, Dilma could win, or the opposition will win. But I think it will go to a second round. It's going to be very close. Right. OK. Uh, so I, I think I'm going to uh, open the, the questions to the public. I just ask you that you know, be short and sweet in your questions. Uh, so we have more people uh, the chance to ask uh, questions. Yes, lady? You in, in you? I know. <laughs> Instead of calling you Dana. <laughs> So, so just to summarize, so, so this can be recorded. And I'm assuming you're referring to Venezuela, right? So what, what is the potential for the protests in Venezuela uh, of turning uh, violent and uh, 
Well, I thought you were talking about Brazil as well, because there were big protests right. in Brazil. Right. Uh, right. Widespread protests. Uh, okay. uh, and I think that you know the creditable thing in both Brazil and uh, Chile, you know, where there have been big mass protests, is that, is that yeah, okay, the police have kept order, but I mean, you know, there hasn't been um, uh, violent repression. Indeed, in Brazil, the, there are kind of small groups of anarchist demonstrations who are quite violent, right? But I mean, it's to Dilma Rousseff's great credit that, you know, unlike the government in Turkey or, or, or in, um, uh, in Ukraine uh, and so on, you know, she did not, she said people have a right to demonstrate. This is democracy. And this is democracy in Latin America, and that's the big difference with, with the Arab Spring. I think Venezuela is a, difficult ca a different case. I mean, you've more than, around 40 people have been killed in, in, the, in the demonstration of Venezuela already. Um, okay, it's true that um, the opposition uh, some of those have been killed because the opposition put up barricades, including kind of wires, trip wires, you know, uh, and some police were killed in that way. Uh, but most of those who were killed were killed, they were shot dead or beaten to death by uh, the police or by uh, armed Chavistas, right? Uh, and the worry in Venezuela is that it could get much more violent. You know, I don't think that will apply elsewhere in the region, you know, as a general rule. Um, because, you know, the stakes are very high in Venezuela. And um, uh, both sides are very scared of what's going to happen in Venezuela. The opposition is scared that it will become a totalitarian country. The regime is scared of going to jail, you know, many people in the regime for corruption and drug trafficking. And the Cubans, who, you know, there are thousands and thousands of Cuban security people in Venezuela. And, you know, they're worried that if the regime falls, Venezuelan aid, which amounts to 15% of Cuban GDP, it's massive, it's like, the Soviet, it's like the Soviet subsidies, would be switched off. So the stakes are very high for all the actors, and that's why it's so dangerous in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, if, I, I mean, I threw that in because, I mean, Uruguay has just uh, uh, decided to uh, legalize uh, marijuana. Um, it's the first country in the world to do so, um, uh, to legalize not just the consumption, but the production and sale, legalize and regulate, like Colorado and Washington State. Marijuana is not cocaine. Um, most of the money for drug traffickers comes from cocaine, but they do get money from marijuana. I think there is a wind of change blowing through the drug policy world, you know. I think it's illusory to imagine that there will be general legalization of all drugs. But if there is more legalization of drugs, that would at least uh, uh, reduce some of the profits uh, and the profitability of uh, the criminal syndicates in the, in, in, in the region. Now, unfortunately, it would come too late in many ways because many of them have, have expanded into, you know, diversified into other illegal activities such as extortion and kidnapping and just rackets generally. But, um, uh, but um, you know, there's no doubt that historically uh, one of the reasons why Latin America is so violent is what was originally the externally induced demand for drugs, right? Um, I mean, Brazil is now the world's second largest cocaine consumer after this country. No? Um, there's a lot of consumption now. But, um, so um, I think legalization would help, but I mean, it's going to be a slow process. Yeah. Yes? How, how can he what, sorry? How, the safety how the concerns, yeah. Is the state? Um, yeah. Can, can you safety. Yeah. Security. Yeah. Uh, but more specifically, how could the president himself, um, what are the biggest things he can do? So if I can just try to understand the question so we can record it. So your question is about how can the, the Mexican president address the issues of security in Mexico? Uh, I think it's a very good question. And um, uh, when, if one tries to ask him that question, he, he um, uh, he uh, tends to change the subject. Um, uh, uh, he talks about 
investment in communities, which is great. You know, I mean, it's great to provide um, uh, options for young people in, in, uh, so that they don't join gangs. But the problem is, there is a central problem of lack of the capacity of the Mexican state to prevent crime, investigate crime, prosecute crime, punish crime, right? Um, and that uh, Mexico has a profusion of police forces, many of which are, because they're at three levels, it's a federal country, and many, at lower level they're penetrated by, uh, by, uh, by the gangs, um, the mafias. Um, and um, I think he doesn't really have a worked out security strategy. What he was determined to do was to halt the war on drugs of his predecessor. And, you know, for good reasons. I mean, sending the army out onto the streets for six years is a bad idea because the army kills, you know, that's, what, that's his job, you know. Uh, and um, Calderon was supposed to do that as an emergency measure to build a much bigger federal police force. It's, it's, it's a bit bigger, but it's not big enough. Um, Peña Nieto came in with the idea of strengthening the state police forces, but yeah, that's good, but you know, it takes time. Um, they've been lucky, they've caught El Chapo Guzman, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, but he didn't make a great fuss about that. Why? Because he really doesn't want to talk about security. He really wants to change the subject because he knows that it's not a vote winner, you know. Um, so I think Mexico needs a more active strategy and it has to focus on the core functions of, of, um, of policing and, and, and the judiciary and the prisons, you know. And yes, of course, at the same time, you need to provide programs that will offer, you know, uh, uh, legal alternatives to, to, to young people in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Questions? Sir? There's one over here. Yeah, one I think, over I here. think here, yes. Yeah. No, no, over there. So let me repeat a question. So, uh, how can we compare the influence of the European Union, China, and the United States in, in Latin America, and who's winning, who's losing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very good point. And of course, um, historically, European influence has been, you know, very great in Latin America. Um, and the further south you go, the more important, uh, relatively, trade with Europe is compared with trade with the United States. Um, uh, and European investment, uh, particularly Spanish and actually British, um, uh, in uh, mining, for example, has been very important. Historically, German investment in, in manufacturing industry in Brazil is, uh, is, uh, is, remains extremely important. I mean, you know, by one count, Sao Paulo is the largest single German industrial city, you know. Uh, um, but, uh, I think the EU has been, the EU used to be the most important aid provider. Uh, it probably still is, but the region leads much less aid than it used to because it's much less poor than it used to be. Um, there's no doubt the EU has been very wrapped up in its own problems in the, for the last you know, few years. Uh, and I think it's kind of been a much less active player as a result. I mean, Spain in recent times has been the most, most active European diplo diplomatic player, but Spain finds itself you know, with its own problems and the balance of you know, Brazil is now much more important than Spain. You know? so, um, but 
who's winning and who's losing? Well, there's no doubt that China, the availability of Chinese finance has helped the Venezuelan government, the Ecuadorian government, to a certain extent the Cuban government, to remain in power. There's no doubt about that. Um, the US, uh, I, I mean, China has become a very important trader, uh, but there are frictions in the relationship because you know, China is now Brazil's largest trade partner, for example. But 70% of what Brazil exports to China is soybeans and iron ore and crude oil. And Chinese imports, export, Chinese exports to Brazil are manufacturers. And uh, uh, a lot of them are undercutting by them. They're cheaper than Brazilian manufacturers. So there are a lot of squeals and, and there's a lot of pain in Brazil as a result of that. So um, China coming from a, a very low base has become a very important economic presence in the region. Um, but China's not exactly a free lunch either, you know? I mean, uh, and, and the Venezuelans and Ecuadorians will find that in the, at the end of the day, the Chinese will want to be repaid. I mean, you know, um, uh, the, I think the US decline outside the handful of countries governed by the anti-American left, uh, US influence has declined relatively more than, abs more than absolutely. And it's declined uh, because China is a new player in the region. Uh, and because, you know, like Brazil is, is important in its own terms in South America, you know. Um, uh, I think for Mexico and Central America and the Caribbean, the US remains you know, the important external power. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of several in, in the rest of South America, no? Mm -hmm. Yep. So you, um, you said before that uh, part of the, I guess, decade of strong Latin American growth is kind of the, uh, some of the after effects of some of the liberal, neoliberal reforms of the Washington consensus. Um, So, so the question is about if the informal economy has all these negative consequences, what can we do to have less of it, right? To formalize the economy. I mean, well, I don't agree with the premise actually, but I mean, um, but, I mean um, it's certainly true that um, what I would call liberal, not neoliberal, but um, uh, uh, economic, in other words, free market economic reforms, they, change, they can change the structure of the economy and that, that can have a transitional effect of raising unemployment in some sectors. That's certainly true. But they have also led, they have also contributed to faster growth and to a growth in, in employment. But your point about the relationship to the informal economy, I mean look, the informal economy predates the Washington Consensus in Latin America. And the informal economy is really a product of the fact that Latin America urbanized very fast and it urbanized faster than it industrialized. And so you had um, uh, a lot of people leaving the countryside, going to the cities, and, um, the, uh, and there weren't formal jobs for them. So they created their own jobs, right? And to the extent that the informal economy is partly a consequence of regulation uh, and red tape, uh, and, um, and a lot of that regulation, particularly of labor markets, actually predates the Washington Consensus because the area where there has been least structural reform in Latin America is labor legislation. Um, then I actually would turn the question back in the face of the questioner and say that um, uh, I think that informality is, has just as much to do with the past model of state-led protectionist development than the Washington Consensus. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for Jeff. Yeah. 
So is, is Chavez the champion of the poor or uh, or authoritarian leader? <laughs> yeah, it's true that Chavez was a Catholic. It's true that he gave um, a lot of oil money to the poor, but it's also true that he wrecked the country. Um, and, um, uh, the, the key fact about Chavez is what happened to oil prices. Um, if you, um, in the 13 years that Hugo Chavez was in power, in real terms, discounting inflation, he, Venezuela's oil revenues were two and a half times as big as they were in the 13 years before Chavez came to power. And yet, Venezuela is now an economic mess and is not growing, right? Why? Because he spent those, and a lot of those, it's true, he's revered by many people, by many poorer Venezuelans, that is true. He's revered as a saint, right? But what he didn't do was provide these people with, um, you know, a, a formula for lasting prosperity and democracy in Venezuela, right? And a lot of those social programs are about political control. So you get, the, you, you get the benefit as long as you vote for him, as long as you support the party, as long as you go to meetings and all those things, right? I don't think that's the right way to build a prosperous democracy. I think it should be based on citizenship and on the idea that of merit and of the idea of need, right? And not of political loyalty. Yeah? Um, so, but, you know, Venezuela is a rather special case because it's a country, um, well, it was a, a, a Venezuelan oil minister in the 1960s who's, who called oil the devil's excrement. And, um, you know, there are massive, what economists call rents involved in oil. In other words, you get lots of money for doing nothing. And um, uh, Venezuela was badly managed before. But the thing that really messed up Venezuela was the low oil prices of the 1980s. And the whole, the previous system of redistribution and of social programs broke down because of, there wasn't any money anymore. And that's what brought Chavez to power. He was a very lucky man in the sense that he, the oil prices started to go up, which was not because of him, it was because of the industrialization of China. So he got much more oil money and, one, and he died before the full consequences of his folly were, became apparent. Mm -hmm. just, just a footnote, I, I remember when Chavez was first elected, the price of uh, oil was about 10 or $12 a okay. barrel. Okay. And then a few years later, reached as high as $110, which is a significant windfall <coughs> and, and resources <coughs> you could use. Uh, <coughs> but maybe time Actually, for just one, oh, oh, <coughs> can I just close? <laughs> <coughs> can I just add a footnote? That okay. I think the popularity of Chavez amongst the poor in Venezuela, is a critique of the historic kind of lack of social concern and social consciousness of you know, other politicians in the region. And I do think that is slowly changing. And I do think that as democracy um, becomes more of a habit, and the point I was making that uh, politicians of the center and the right you know, are learning that if you want to govern you want to be elected in countries uh, uh, where there are a lot of poor people. You can't ignore those poor people, right? You have to, but you know you should be offering opportunity to those poor people so that they cease to be poor. Uh, that's that's what I would say. I think that's a great way to end uh, this conversation. Thank you very much for uh, your all your questions and for your uh, attendance. And uh, until the next time, so let's give uh, Michael Reed a great. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. That was great. Mm -hmm.